Hello class, we were done discussing about lesson 1 which is the cell from various philosophical perspectives. I hope that you gained something from that lesson. Anyway, I hope that you are still hanging in there with your studies. Just believe class that after this challenge, we will turn out to be better persons. But of course, that depends on us. With this, let's proceed to lesson 2 which is the self, society, and culture. This time around, let's identify the relationship of the self-formation with our society and culture. But before we go further, let's define self first. The self is commonly defined by the following characteristics. It is separate, self-contained, independent, consistent, unitary, and private. The self is separate. It is meant that the self is distinct from other selves. The self is always unique and has its own identity. One cannot be another person. Even twins are distinct from each other. No matter how similar you are with your brother or your sister, you are not your brother. You are not your sister. And your brother or sister is not you. That's why you should not compare yourself with other selves because no matter what you do, you are unique and different from other selves. Second, self is also self-contained and independent because in itself it can exist. Its distinctness allows it to be self-contained with its own thoughts, characteristics, and volition. It does not require any other self for it to exist. It means further that you don't need to comply requirements for you to exist. You have the freedom to believe what you want to believe. You are allowed to contain your thoughts, feelings, and emotions or express them through actions. The self is also consistent because it has a personality that is enduring and therefore it can be expected to persist for quite some time. Its consistency allows it to be studied, described, and measured. Consistency also means that a particular self-traits, characteristics, tendencies, and potentialities are more or less the same. So say for example, class, if you know someone who has the tendency to be egocentric and does not like to listen to other people or does not like to receive criticisms from other people, this egocentric characteristic would become apparent in his doing of things. So probably... If he is in a group, he often makes conflict among members because he does not want to accept his own mistakes. He does not want to accept suggestions from his groupmates. He only sees himself class and technically he lacks the ability to empathize. Diba no? So empathize, empathize class, uh, to empathize is to put yourself into the situation of other people. It means seeing the point of view of other people. No, but an egocentric person does not know how to do empathy. Right? Now, on the other hand, if you know someone, a man who is by nature organized and goal oriented, again, it will always show in everything that he does, say in his academics, career, and even a little things such as simple tasks at home. So, a person like this often has a checklist or a planner which guides him in the attainment of his goal. Um, we have to remember, class, that these characteristics or tendencies are always present in every pattern of our actions and behaviors. They are very difficult to hide because they become a part of us. They become a habit. No? And according to many class, old habits die hard. Self is unitary because it is the center of all experiences and thoughts that run through a certain person. It's like the chief command pose in an individual where all processes, emotions, and thoughts converge. The self gives meaning to all of these emotions, experiences, thoughts, and everything that goes in our mind class. So, of course, it is also the self that decides whether a particular experience is significant or not. Finally, the self is private. How we process information, feelings, emotions, and our thoughts is never accessible to anyone but the self. It suggests that the self is isolated from the external world. It lives within its own world. 
So every self has its own inner universe and no one can access to that inner universe but the self. As much as the self is separate, independent, consistent, unitary, and private, the self as well is greatly influenced by external factors which actually provide everything that we experience. These experiences compose the external reality that we have which eventually shapes the self one way or another. This makes the self ever-changing and dynamic. This perspective is known as the self-constructionist perspective which argues for a merged view of the person and his social context where boundaries of one cannot be easily separated from the boundaries of other. This supports the idea that no man is an island. You influence other people as they also influence you in return. So how do we exactly influence one another class? Of course, that is through communication and interaction, through exchange of ideas, opinions, beliefs, and cultures. That is why, class, it is social. Our social interactions influence the shaping of our selves. And because we always have this communication and interaction in our lives, the self has been in a dynamic state, meaning it is not static. Imagine class a wheel which does not stop. The self is like that. The self always moves and adjusts to the events of the society. The self is malleable like a clay. It can take any shape depending on the situations that it is in. Say for example, if you are at home, you can be the obedient daughter or son. You can be the lazy or disorganized person that you are. However, if you happen to have a field trip with your classmates and teachers, you become conscious of your mess, right? One way or another, you would try to be organized just for that circumstance. Another example class is you, how you address people. You have different manner of speaking at home. You can be the sweet, joker, informal guy. However, you are not going to talk to your instructors in the same way. You would try to use po and opo probably and be respectful most of the times. With this class, we can say that the self is capable of morphing and fitting itself into any circumstance it finds itself in. Maybe you would ask me, Ma'am, how can we exactly remain the same person if we always turn into a chameleon by adapting to our social situations? A French anthropologist, Marcel Moss, has an explanation for this phenomenon class. According to him, every self has two faces, the person and moi. The moi refers to a person's sense of who he is, his body and his basic identity, his biological givenness. Person, on the other hand, is composed of the social concepts of what it means to live in a particular institution, a particular family, a particular religion, a particular nationality, and how to behave given expectations and influences from others. From this, we can infer that if the moi is our real face, the person is the masks that we wear in every situation that we have masks as in plural because of course we will encounter various situations in our life and in every situation we will wear different masks for example class for overseas filipino workers or ofws they need to adjust with the cultures of the country they are in in order to survive so if here in the philippines they can just neglect traffic rules and garbage disposal rules. If they're in Japan or Singapore, they cannot do the same thing because basically it is not their territory. They need to practice the laws in that country or else they would be thrown outside the country that they are in. This very situation applies as well to how you, Manaus, adjust if you are not in your territory, if you are not in Marawi City. And how Cebuanos and Surigaonuns 
become culturally sensitive here in Marawi. How we avoid speaking of haram words, especially in public places. Language is another interesting aspect of this social constructivism. The Filipino language is incredibly interesting to talk about. The way by which we articulate our love is denoted by the phrase, Mahal kita. This, of course, is the Filipino translation of, I love you. The Filipino brand of this articulation of love, unlike in English, does not specify the subject and the object of love. There is no specification of who loves and who is loved. There is simply a word for love, and that is mahal, and the pronoun kita, which is a second-person pronoun that refers to the speaker and the one being talked to. In the Filipino language, unlike in English, there is no distinction between the lover and the beloved. They are one. Interesting, too, is the word mahal. In Filipino, the word can mean both love and expensive. In our language, love is intimately bound with value, with being expensive, being precious. Something expensive is valuable. Someone whom we love is valuable to us. The Sanskrit origin of the word love is love, which means desire. Technically, love is a desire. The Filipino word for it has another intonation apart from mere desire, valuable. Another interesting facet of our language is its being gender neutral. In English, Spanish, and other languages, the distinction is clear between a third-person male and third-person female pronoun. He and she, el and ella. In Filipino, it is plain siya. There is no specification of gender. Our language does not specify between male and female. We both call it sha. Speaking of language class, for Mead and Vygotsky, the way that human persons develop is with the use of language acquisition and interaction with others. The way that we process information is normally a form of an internal dialogue in our head. Say for example, class, you are about to make a decision. Of course, before making one, you are going to think about it several times, especially if it's a big decision, before picking up an option. You have this internal dialogue in your mind, such as, should I do this or that? But if I do this, it will be like this. Will I be happy at the end if I pick this one? So, these are examples, class, of um, internal dialogues that we usually have. They believe that how the child learns to communicate and how he exactly handles his affective aspect, which includes emotions and feelings, are through imitation of the people around him. As the child grows, the amount of his exposures and experiences also grow, which provide him opportunities to encounter various dialogues and conversations. In this, the child internalizes values, norms, practices, and social beliefs. For example, class, when we were young, our parents always reminded us of how it is important to believe in God. We understood the value in it. And until now, we are doing the same thing because of the situations in the past that emphasized the said value. In fact, class, everything that we have right now, our intellect, our sense of morality, our skills, everything we owe it to our past interaction. And of course, we have um, promised development if we continue to have dialogues and conversations with various people. Furthermore, the way we learn and speak our language, we got that from the people around us. Notice how a parent teaches a child how to speak, such as mama or papa. How a teacher trains the child to do basic greetings, such as good morning ma'am, good morning classmate, how are you today? Up to how college instructors let students explain a concept in an oral recitation. Family also plays a vital role in our self-formation. Remember that it is in the family that we learn to do the basic of everything. We learn our language and culture because we have families. We have different perceptions of morality and values because we were taught during our childhood. How we present ourselves in front of others how we acquire manners in doing things, and even how we cope with various challenges in our lives, we owe it to our families.
Without a family, biologically and sociologically, a person may not even survive or become a human person. For example, in the case of Tarzan class, although it is a miracle that he survived the plane crash when he was still a baby and grows into a man with the help of the animals in the jungle, we cannot say that Tarzan is a human because he does not have the language of man and the intellect of man. He does not behave like a man but like an animal instead. He does not have a culture which makes one a human. He does not have a selfhood that any human has. But this is until he met the love of his life, Jane, who taught him everything which makes a man. Finally, we have gender. Gender is different from sex. While sex is biologically oriented such as male and female, gender is socially oriented such as gay, lesbian, transgender, bisexual, etc. It is one of the aspects of the self which is subject to alteration, change, and development. This explains how one moment a male feels like he is a man and then another moment he feels feminine. This is what we call gender fluidity. How we identify and behave ourselves is largely influenced by our society. This is evident how husbands, for the most part, provide for the families, how they make major decisions. On the other hand, many Filipinos until today view women as the caregivers of the family. They are tasked to do the houseworks. These premeditated roles of men and women are carried out from the parents to their children. However, time changes. Today, the rise of LGBT community gives way to practices which are not mutually exclusive to one gender only. Women are empowered to do things that men also do, while men are also allowed to do the same. Before, it was very challenging for women to pursue a program where men dominate, such as architecture and engineering. But now, it is normal. In fact, here in PSE, many females are enrolled in civil engineering program. Another class, before it was mostly women who applied makeup, now we can actually witness men, specifically K-pops, also do the same. They pluck their eyebrows, they apply lip balm, moisturizer, face powder, etc.